Thank you very much for being on my show today. My pleasure. You're the founder of DeadSimpleSaving.com. And uh, before we get into what you do at the moment, um, I'd like to intro you very quickly. Sure. Um, you read psychology at Cambridge. And uh, over the past 17 years, you have advised the top management of banks, insurers, asset managers, and sovereign wealth funds, including princes and prime ministers. Very cool. Um, and then in 2005, you were assigned to a, well, you, you had an opportunity to come to the Middle East, to Kuwait, yep. for a five-month project. And uh, this, is, this was your first time here. And I presume you liked it here, so you stuck. Yeah, life-changing project. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, you went, went on to do some pretty interesting things, including uh, a nation-building project in Saudi. You know, eight years ago, something happened, uh, which led you to, you know, fast forward to today, doing talks on financial wellness at corporates and running workshops for individuals on expat saving and investing. You're also a board member of uh, Simplify and a regular contributor to the Nationals Debt Panel. As a consumer champion, you've appeared uh, frequently on Dubai Eye and recently on a debate which I'm looking forward to watching, uh, which was the Arabian business crossfire supporting SMEs. What happened eight years ago that led you to this path? Yeah, how did I end up as a, a consumer champion? I'm, I'm not, can I call myself that? I, I'm working towards it, you know. Um, I think, you know, I was never one of these people who age five said, I want to be a consumer champion for, for personal finance, uh, for expats or anything like that. Um, but if you, if you look backwards and connect the dots, you can kind of see how, how I ended up here. I, I was always interested in psychology and, and when it comes to money, there's an en enormous psychological element. Uh, it's like health and relationships because it's intangible. It, it's all in our head. And so, and so people inherit a lot of weird beliefs, um, either from their parents or from their culture. And it takes quite a lot to, to snap out of that. So I was always interested in that. Um, then I think my, my work in financial services led me to um, people just coming up to me and saying, oh, can you help me with my personal finances? Even though that wasn't really the area I was working in. I suppose it's like doctors. Uh, you're at a party and people always take you aside and say, well, I've got this mole on my wrist, can you have a look? Um, and so people were coming up to me and, and asking me these questions. And um, what happened in 2010 is, is I, I felt like I didn't, I didn't want to be a management consultant anymore. Um, I think it, it's a fantastic profession. I learned so much. Um, I, I'm still in touch with, with, with all my colleagues from back then. Um, but I wanted to try something different that didn't involve writing slides so much. And you almost bought a long-term savings product, yeah? I did, I did. So um, I think 2011, I remember, you know, you think, oh, I've got to go and sort out my finances. You, you uh, book in with a financial advisor in Dubai and you pat yourself on the back and you're like, well done, Steve. You know, you're an adult today. You really like got this part of your life sorted. Um, and little did you realize that, that the, these are just pure salespeople who are trying to sell you products. Um, I almost persuaded myself into buying one of these 25 year plans. It sounded too good to be true. Um, and it was just one of my friends, close friend who said, I nearly got burnt by one of these products. Please don't, please. She begged me, please don't buy one of these. And I started researching. Sorry, was it an insurance broker? Um, it was, a, it was a financial advisor, it wasn't an insurance broker. So, you know, someone who, who takes commission to sell these products and does planning for you. What I find interesting is that, you know, you've obviously accomplished so much in your, you know, day job of being a management consultant for banks and things like that. But when it comes to personal finances, you chose to consider a financial advisor at that point, which yeah. for me is uh, true as well because it seems that in school and university no matter what kind of business degree you do and what kind of A-levels or whatever you do they don't really teach you about what to do with your own money. You're absolutely right and um, a number of my colleagues since I've learned how to do expat personal finance um, a lot of my some of my colleagues from from before who, who are you know very well respected in, in the field of financial services 
they don't know about some of the basic tenets of, of personal finance just because it's not taught at school and, and they don't have to know it for their business. If they're advising corporates, asset managers, it's even, even retail banking, frankly, it just doesn't come up. Um, things like financial independence is just a completely new way of thinking that, that hasn't been taught to us. So it has been very surprising. Um, and if I look back on my own personal finance, it's, uh, it's just a series of mistakes when you, as you believe what the newspapers say, you believe what the industry says, just a series of mistakes until one day you find that one website that snaps you out of it and your eyes, it's, it's exactly like the matrix. You take that pill, suddenly your eyes are opened and you're like, wow, no one teaches this. Yeah, so, you know, in a nutshell, what would you call your, because I know you have a very specific style of extremely simple investing, which for me is a game changer. Um, it takes away a lot of the effort and time, and in fact, it gets you out of the way, like you said, um, of, of your long-term uh, progress uh, from a financial perspective. What would you name this? Would you call it DIY investing? Would you call it ETF investing or passive investing? Yeah, I say, I suppose, um, low-cost passive index investing. Um, there's a bit of jargon in there, but essentially, what's, what's going to destroy your retirement portfolio? It's you paying high fees, whether to a platform or to a fund manager or to an advisor. Um, it's you jumping in and out of the market, trying to be too clever. And I think this is where the former financial services people have, have gone wrong because they think they understand uh, financial services and so they take risks that they shouldn't. Um, and, and then just uh, not being properly diversified and putting too, too many bets on Tesla or too many bets on America or Chinese tech startups or, or whatever it is. Um, and and there have been studies that show that really the best performers over the long term are people who get their brain out of the way when it comes to investing. So it's the opposite of when you're going to work earning money. There, you put your brain to work and you earn more money. When it comes to investing, you have to get your brain out of the way. and and the smarter you are and the more you think you know about financial services, the worse you're going to do. And I've got an interesting example, actually. So um, one of my friends, super smart guy, extremely successful in banking now. Back in 2004, he thought he would buy a nice property in the US, in Florida, like nice Florida mansion. And he thought, well, you know what? I can get a super low interest rate uh, mortgage if I get the, the mortgage in Swiss francs. And of course, what happened in 2008 is that the value of his property crashed um, at least by half. And the value of his mortgage, because everyone fled towards Swiss francs, the value of his mortgage doubled. So he was in real, real trouble and he's still paying off that mortgage today. Whereas had he been less savvy about financial services, had he got his brain out of the way, um, he, he at least wouldn't have got a Swiss franc mortgage trying to be too clever and he probably wouldn't have bought that property in the first place. So circling to low cost ETF index investing, yep. let's put some numbers to it. Um, if you buy an ETF, you're paying 25 basis points yep. or in that region, even, even, less than even lesser. So, so I, I, you know, ETFs, I always say that ETF could stand for expat total freedom. You know, they are right. like just the, the ultimate tool for expat personal finance. Um, because expats aren't allowed to buy a lot of that stuff. We, we can't easily buy mutual funds, so we have to buy exchange-traded funds. Um, and, and what that means is that you might have access to a global index of 3,000 stocks across the world. And that's packaged up in one ETF, let's say the Vanguard FTSE All World USITS ETF. And, and at the click of a button, take you five minutes, you click a button, you say, I want to buy this ETF, and you're literally buying the world. And, and that's amazingly powerful and amazingly simple, and it's going to cost you like 0.22%. As opposed to the products which typically a bank or a financial advisor might be promoting here in Dubai, uh, which would be a more actively managed or an actively managed mutual fund. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, what's typically sold, there's, there's several layers of complexity and I think to understand why these things are sold, um, it's, it's really to uh, get commission. As far as I can see, these products exist 
to generate commission for financial services companies, both for the brokers and for the product providers, who are the insurers who are providing the platform, but also uh, underneath that for the fund managers as well. So it seems really like the industry conspiring against expats. And, and remember, these products, these long-term insurance wrap savings plans, um, have been banned in, in the UK, in the US, um, and in Europe uh, for, for decades, and yet they're still hiding out here. And interestingly, what happened in, in Hong Kong is that they banned the upfront commission from the sale of these products. I mean, you could literally get, as an advisor, get $10,000 the day that your client signs, yeah. boom, $10,000. Even though your first payment might be you know, $500 yeah, for absolutely. your first monthly absolutely. payment. Absolutely, so, so um, these people will, will sell their grandma to, to, to get you one of these products. Um, when that upfront commission was banned in Hong Kong, the sale of these products went down by 90%. And that shows you they were only being sold for commission. They weren't being sold because they helped the individual. So these products are massively complex. What you have is you have a, a platform that enables the, the individual to buy funds within that platform. So firstly, you're paying platform fees. Then you have to pay fund management fees. And the funds that you typically get put in um, often they are whatever looked good last year. Um, and so you might get people's pensions being invested 25% energy stocks, 25% Russia, 25% Brazil, 25% Indian health startups, right? Now obviously there's nothing wrong with Indian health startups, but they shouldn't be 25% You shouldn't be having portfolio. that exposure. It's huge exposure and it's absolutely insane. So there's like in some of these portfolios, there's literally no U.S. exposure, right? As we know, like the U.S. makes up about 55% of the global stock market. Um, there's zero exposure. And so instead of all this complexity, you can literally just buy one ETF in five minutes. It'll cost you 0.22% and a click of button. And, and, and as a exposure. result, you know, you're not paying an insurance broker or a financial advisor. You're not paying an insurance company yep. and you're not paying a bank to manage a fund and to try and beat the stock market. Exactly. You're effectively, you, we've seen productivity growth over the last 100 years. We've seen the global stock market growing at a very good rate. What is it, was it, is it seven or 8% or yeah, something so like that? Yeah, so typically, I mean, the S&P 500 has grown at about 10.1% over the past 30 years. So compound um, that. But let's say, let's say 7%, be a bit more conservative, 7%. Um, the power of compounding that 7% year on year on year, that's what's going to get your retirement portfolio to a huge number and allow you to live off that, off that portfolio. What do you do? Are you selling products? I'm not selling products. And that's what's so wonderful. I think that's why I'm so happy in life is that, that I, I don't have any financial products to sell whatsoever. Um, I, I have no um, paid affiliations with any financial services companies. And that allows me to be independent. I think what I've discovered is how to invest as an expat by yourself in the cheaply and most statistically successful way over the long term. And I just want to teach people that. So I literally just charge for my time. If a corporate wants to come uh, and uh, pay me to do a workshop, I'll, I'll do that and I will stay there at the corporate for as long as people have questions. I'm totally happy to stay there. Um, I also run workshops for individuals on weekends, um, literally 10 hours over the weekend. Um, you can take people from total zero, clueless about finance, having read nothing, all the way to like ETF investing hero. Um, because I think what puts people off is, is two things. Firstly, um, just the lack of knowledge of how to invest as an expat. And secondly, the fear of doing it themselves. People say, I'm bad at money. I shouldn't be investing. The stock market is risky. And what I love to teach people is that actually you, you absolutely can invest by yourself and you'll be... Uh, you'll be far more successful than if you put your hands in, uh, you put your money in the hands of someone who, who doesn't have your best interests at heart, that is primarily looking to get commission out of you. So I read your article in The National yesterday, and you were talking about putting all your money into a single ETF, or two maybe, one for equity and the other for bonds. Exactly. Isn't that crazy risky? No, I would say it's the opposite. I think, I think there's a real beauty in simplicity. And again, I, I always say that you need to take your brain out of the equation when it comes to investing. Um, there's, a, there's a study that was done where uh, one of these major asset managers looked at who, 
who of all their millions of clients have been the most successful over the past 10 years. And the people who have been the most successful were either dead or they had uh, forgotten their login codes and not logged in for 10 years. Now this tells us a lot, it tells us that simplicity, taking your brain out of the way is what's really gonna make you successful. So I think um, when, when I say I've got my entire stock allocation in one ETF, it does sound crazy, but remember within that, um, that ETF has 3,100 stocks underneath it across 47 countries of the world. So it's very diversified. Uh, people do get worried about, you know, what if Vanguard, so the asset manager, what if they go bankrupt? Or what if my broker goes bankrupt? Um, but um, the asset manager doesn't have access to your money. Um, and if, you, if they did, if for some reason they broke all the laws and they reached through and stole it, um, there are legal protections in place um, and there is also insurance in place uh, to, to protect you and get you your money back. I think you're a lone soldier here because most of the time, <laughs> you know, you meet bankers, um, investment advisors, financial advisors, insurance brokers. I'm an insurance broker, but, yeah. you know, you meet insurance brokers on what I call the dark side. Um, and what they're promoting are mutual funds. And when you ask them about passively, you know, passive ETFs, low cost ETFs, the typical reaction is that they'll roll their eyes and say, why do you want to perform in line with the stock market when you can beat the stock market? And the job of an active manager is to beat the stock market because they're actually working and doing a lot of research to, um, you know, allocate your funds in a way that will far exceed the average returns of the whole stock market. So well, how do you respond if, to that? If only that was true. And actually the, the active fund management industry is in crisis at the moment. Um, and, and even star managers who have been stars for 25 years have really crashed and burned in the past, 20 year, in the past couple of years. Now, what we see statistically, hard statistics, is that um, active management where you're picking stocks um, is more expensive. So the funds are typically going to charge you 10 times the fees. So instead of paying 0.22%, you might be paying 2.2%. Uh, um, they're much more expensive. And you find that when you net off the fees, uh, the very few active managers are actually able to outperform the stock index. So there's a myth that by buying and selling more actively and being smart, you can outperform the index. Unfortunately, the statistics show that to be completely untrue. There is a small percentage of people, almost by chance, who are a small percentage of funds who are able to outperform the stock market. And if yes, if you could find those, then you could invest in them. But the question is... But then the again, it's the beauty of hindsight, right? Well, yes, exactly. They're, just because the they've done it for the past 10 years doesn't mean they'll exactly, do it for the next 10 years. Exactly. And what's the persistency? If we look at those people in any given year, those fund managers who've been able to outperform the market, and over one year, that might be 25% of, of funds investing in the S&P 500 outperforming. Over five years, it might be 8% of those. But if you look in one year, those who've outperformed, and you look five years later how many of those top people, top fund managers, have outperformed the stock market and are still in that top quartile? It's less than 1%. So there's no persistency. It seems it's almost all chance. And mind you, they have to beat the index net of their own fees, exactly. which is a big job. Exactly. And actually what we see is that these companies tend to underperform the stock index by the same size as their fees, which suggests that all they're really doing, on average, is tracking the index. They're effectively closet, in the, or they are closet index funds. Yeah, net of, you know, some are going to outperform, some underperform, but ultimately they are just tracking. So my message is to, to individual investors, my message is forget all that. Forget what you read in the newspapers. Who's paying for the adverts in the newspapers? It's the fund managers, it's the brokers, it's the, the people with the cash. Um, forget all that just passively tracking the stock market over the long term will make you more money. We've seen the longest ever expansion uh, in a long time of the US economy. Um, things have been good for the most part since the financial crisis of 2008. Um, someone who's looking to invest now or to enter the market now, 
or someone who's already invested, you know, statistically, isn't it likely with the infamous yield curve inverting and all of that to kind of stay out of the market, be in cash and enter whenever there's a crash. This could be a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, but a correction is almost, you know, something that you know, will happen. Yes, so I mean, there is a correction of about 10% almost every year. And then, you know, at least three times in our lifetime, there's going to be some epic mega crash uh, that will just take over all the headlines and, and scare people. Um, I, I think the, again, you have to get your brain out, out of the way in this. There's, there's a few different types of investors who need to think about this. So there's people who have a big lump sum of money who, who need to put it to work in the market. There's people who are gonna put a bit of their salary every single month, and then there's people who are retired. Um, and we can look at this case for, for each of these because it's a little bit differently. Um, the person who has a big lump sum, it is scary to put it in the market. And the day you put it to, to work in the market, you know that there's a 50% chance it's gonna be lower at the end of the day uh, mm -hmm. because that's just what the stats say. Um, but after 20 years, there's almost a 0% chance that it will be down after 20 years. So for the long term, it's not gambling. Now, um, yes, it will be scary if that person puts all their money in and there's a downturn. But statistically, again, that is proven to be the best thing to do is to put your money in and then just treat it like you've got you know, forget about it for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Because if the market goes down and you yank it out, then you're going to have crystallized that loss. Now, yes, you could say, well, I'm going to time the market. But how easy really is that? If you look at 2008 and 2009, the reversal when the stock market started going back up again, I think April 2009, it was so fast. If you look at the stock market chart, um, 2008, 2009, it looks like this. It's so hard. And I had a friend who pulled all his money out in 2016. Because he was like, ooh, I've had a five-year bull run. Um, this is, you know, I'm a bit scared now. Pulled all his money out. What's happened since then? The market's gone up 30%. Mm -hmm. And he's stuck. He doesn't know whether to put his money back in. Uh, he doesn't know whether to wait for a downturn. And I guarantee when you're waiting for that downturn, you'll be too scared to put your money in because you'll think it will go down faster and you'll just miss the reversal. So um, what I say is for, for a lump sum, um, remember you're going to be earning dividends when you put that money to work. I would say even though it's psychologically hard, the statistically best thing to do is just to put it in. If you cannot handle that, put in as much as you can bear psychologically and then split up the rest and just put it in every month. Um, for the person who, who just wants to be investing their salary every month and has a bit of, you know, more than five years before retirement, doesn't matter what the stock market's doing. Just put a same or hopefully increasing sum of money every single month. You will ride out that roller coaster. And in fact, you will be the person who catches that downturn because you are putting the money in every month. And, and I would say to people, um, you should be delighted when there's a crash because the market is going on sale. If, if Louis Vuitton's having a sale, everyone's happy. But for some reason, when the stock market goes on sale and there's a crash, people get terrified. But actually, you should see, wow, this is an opportunity for me to, to buy shares cheaply that I'm going to hold for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And you should be delighted. Now, the people who shouldn't be so delighted are the retirement people um, because they are not necessarily putting money into their account. For those people, you need a, a, a mix of stocks and bonds, or for Islamic investors, stocks and sukuk and, and maybe gold. Um, because what's going to happen with the bonds is that if the stock market goes down, the value of your bonds are going to go up and net-net your portfolio is going to be less volatile. So you're going to be protected from the craziness. So, you know, for somebody who has 10, 20, 30 years of, you know, work, working life ahead of them, um, they need not worry about it and they should start investing immediately. Would that be your advice? Absolutely. Um, what you need to do is you need to put in place a series of safety nets first. Because remember, the last thing you want to do is invest in the stock market and then something comes up in your life and you have to yank out that money 
possibly in a downturn, you will have crystallized that loss. So you have to avoid that. Yeah, let's talk quickly about liquidity because um, interestingly, ETFs um, are actually liquid in the sense that if you wanted to sell them, you could have your money back tomorrow. Yes. As opposed to many mutual funds that actually have lock-in periods and you know they are considered to be relatively more illiquid. Yes. But on the other hand, from a mindset perspective, you have to think long term. Otherwise, you run the risk of needing the money, you know, a year from when you've invested it. Mm. And, you know, the market quite likely could be down uh, from when you did invest. So what's your approach to that? Would you suggest um, having, you know, your cash as your primary buffer in a bank account and then the rest in the markets or something different? Yes. Yeah, so so liquidity, um, liquidity is very important, as is a bit of financial discipline. You know, you have to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be an adult about this now. Uh, you have to promise that you're not going to yank your money out um, when the stock market crashes because there is that liquidity, right? So the difference between ETF investing and, and a long-term savings plan, a long-term savings plan has this kind of iron discipline, a bit like prison, where you have to pay in money and you can't, cannot get it out very easily without penalties. Um, but we're, we're adults, you know, we don't need that level of discipline, right? So, so um, what I suggest is that you have a cash buffer of three to six months total expenses, mm -hmm. including any loan payments or anything like that, so that if you lose your job or your dad gets sick with no health insurance or something like that, you can survive comfortably for three to six months. That safety net is very important. The second big safety net is to have a think, over the next five years, do I have any major expenditures coming out? Do I have my kids' university fees? Do I have a deposit for a house that I want to put down? Because you don't want to put that money in the stock market. Like the stock market's too volatile over two to five years. Um, that money in the stock market is going away 10 to 30 years. So think, what am I going to need, a big chunk of money in the next five years, start saving that in a high interest savings account, if you can find one, uh, or possibly bonds or something like that, but not in stocks. Then once you've filled those, I call it, you're almost filling bowls. You know, if you have a steady stream of water coming down, like one of those garden ornaments, you're filling those bowls, those safety nets first. And only when they're full, that's when you're putting money into the stock market. And what gets scary for people is that once those bowls are full, you have your safety nets in place and your buffers, you can put 50% of your salary or more straight into the stock market, which feels very scary, but you've got these safety nets in place. And that's putting so much money into the stock market and building up your retirement portfolio is going to be the biggest determinant of a comfortable retirement and also being able to quit your job if you don't like it much earlier than you ever dreamed possible. So what you essentially do is you'll sit down with individuals or corporates um, or, you know, in your seminar you, and you, you know, walk through different circumstances, you know, financially uh, for different individuals and help them decide. Yes. So, so what, I, what I don't do is I don't, I try not to give personalized financial advice. That's not my role. Um, my role is to teach people the basics of financial independence and then to give them rules of thumb that can help them make their own decisions. Um, so let's take an example. You know, what uh, allocation should you have between stocks and bonds? Important decision, right? And different for people, different risk appetites, uh, for people of uh, different stages in retirement, different sources of alternative income. Um, I'm not going to be the person who's going to say, Avinash, you need to put 30% in bonds, um, because that's a personal decision. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a series of rules of thumb and guidelines and frameworks so you can go, okay, this makes sense to me. I feel I should be here and in five years time, I'm going to change it to there. So what I'm doing is I'm sharing my experience. I'm digesting all the information out there and trying to cut a path for people to make it as simple as possible for them to take control of their own finances. We can't talk about financial independence and financial planning and personal finance without uh, thinking about life insurance. What role, in your view, um, does life insurance play in a portfolio and what percentage of your portfolio should be going towards life insurance premiums? So for me, I, I'm a big believer in term life insurance 
when you need it. Um, my concern about other forms of insurance, like whole life insurance, it combines a savings element with um, an insurance element, and, and, and therefore there's a bit of complexity in there. And when you get complexity, you typically see high fees, and the savings, the, what those, that savings component, component is invested in, you typically see uh, that it's not invested particularly efficiently. Yeah, what makes uh, whole life, obviously this is my line of business, so what makes whole life uh, products more complicated and, and, and potentially uh, risky is that they can be unit linked yes. as opposed to guaranteed. Yes. Um, and it's sold as perhaps being more attractive uh, as, you know, being unit linked. But, you know, fundamentally, these are for protection. These are for life insurance. Yes. These are, these are products that will help you to, you know, f have the peace of mind that if anything happens to you, you know, your estate, your, you know, beneficiaries will be taken care of. Yes. Financially. Um, the only benefit of life insurance, of whole of life insurance is that it lasts you, you know, for your whole life. Mm. Um, the only concern is that when they're sold as unit link products um, and sold as investment and life insurance both into a single product is when, you know, you're not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, um, but yeah, on, on term level insurance. Yes. I mean, I think, I think it's important to only buy the amount of insurance that you really need. If you are single and you don't have any dependents and you don't have a mortgage, you simply don't need term life. You don't need any kind of insurance. You know, for a typical, um, in your view, you know, a typical um, resident of Dubai who has their family here, maybe, you know, they're married and a couple of kids, you know, as a scenario, uh, what percentage would you advise, um, you know, as, as insurance professionals, you know, we have our own rules of thumbs and uh, thumb in this respect. But what would you advise um, as a percentage of your income going towards life insurance or a percentage of your portfolio? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think th the beauty of term life insurance is that it's very cheap. And, and, and what does it do? Simply, it says, well, okay, over the next 30 years, yeah. you, you pay in your Or premium. up to 35. Yeah. yeah. And, and you will, um, if you die, you, your, your beneficiaries will receive a payout. And why do you need this? You need this either because uh, your wife and children cannot survive without your salary generating potential. In fact, that's, that's why. Yes. Now, I, I believe the idea should be you pay a little amount of term life insurance and you think, well, what's going to cover my wife and kids so they can live comfortably until they get to um, the earning age and maybe a little bit beyond? so that they can get to 25, maybe 30, and they can stand on their own two feet. That's really all you need insurance for, I believe. Um, by the time that you are 70, hopefully, you will have been investing your money in the stock market sensibly. You will have built up big savings. So that if when you die, let's say age 70, your kids are 30 or, or 40, they can stand on their own two feet, they're going to inherit your big stock portfolio. Your wife's going to be comfortable. There, I just don't see so much a need for, for insurance. And that's yeah. why I'm, I'm okay with term life insurance. Yeah, unless for certain rare scenarios or certain scenarios where, you know, there's tax considerations of, of estate Absolutely. planning and inheritance tax and these kinds of things. But yes, yes. I agree uh, completely yeah, yeah. Uh, for the most part without plugging. But we're big time promoters of term level policies. And I think... 80-90% of the products, uh, of the policies that we uh, do sell as, as a brokerage are, you know, term level protection plans. Yeah. I would never put myself forward as an insurance expert. I would never put myself forward as a tax expert. So I know some rules of thumb and, and I have, you know, my own beliefs that I can explain to people. What, what I want to do is I want to open people's eyes to how to do DIY investing, how to do financial independence, how to know when you can retire. Um, once you do that, then, uh, and I, I have 10 steps to financial independence, but it's an iterative process. Try and go through those steps fairly quickly and then go back round again. Go and talk to an insurance expert. Go and talk to a tax expert. And so then you have all the pieces of the jigsaw. And it's quite rare that one person, one single person can advise you on all those different pieces. Circling back to um, ETFs, you know, at the moment, I think in the U.S., 50% of assets, assets under management are in passive funds. Mm. You know, big change from 10 years ago. Yeah. 
globally though, you know, still 75% of funds are on the active side of things and 25% are in ETFs, you know, what do you think that ratio will be five years from now? Who knows? I mean, I think, I think the, the passive industry is only going to see more inflows. I think if you look at the statistics, if you look at something like the SPIVA report, S-P-I-V-A, uh, generated by Standard & Poor's uh, regularly, uh, these are hard statistics just showing how few active managers are outperforming the index. Um, and therefore, I think passive inflows are going to continue. And we could see that getting up to 50% worldwide, maybe in the US even beyond that. And people will say, well, isn't this going to start to be a problem? But um, really, the, the, the market prices are always going to be set by the active managers. And I think if you got to a crazy situation where only 5% of the money was actively managed, well, that's still going to be setting the price. And if it gets to such an extreme where active managers actually do have an edge, then active management will start to come back. And, and it will uh, gradually, you know, if people can make money over the long term in a statistically proven way, then more investors will go back to active management and we'll find some kind of equilibrium. If, if, if markets become imperfect for any exactly. reason, which they've never been, exactly. but they're who knows always, what the future holds. Always, they'll always uh, find some kind of equilibrium and again. And, and it may be that 75% passive, 25% active, that may end up where, where things are. Um, but it, I don't see it as a cause concern for concern of, of, of passive investors. Do you have any active funds in your own portfolio? No, I, I used to. So I absolutely used to. Um, and, and I drank the Kool-Aid of the financial services industry. And uh, I had all sorts of funds and, that were advised to me by my platform in the UK. Um, and some of them did well and some of them absolutely didn't do well. Um, but what happened is that uh, when I, my friend advised me not to go into this long-term savings plan, she said, you know, do some research. And I started to dig into this. And I found this guy, Andrew Hallam, who's coming to Dubai in, in November. And he became a millionaire on a teacher's salary. And he's written a book, Millionaire Expat, which I advise all expats to read. Honestly, the best 100 dirhams you've ever spent. Um, and I started reading about uh, passive versus active investing, about these long-term savings plans. And my eyes were opened. And I sold all of my active funds. And I invested everything into Vanguard uh, passively. Do you have a two-fund portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, in the UK, for UK investors, it's even simpler. You can just invest in the Vanguard Life Strategy Fund, and that has stocks and bonds um, all wrapped in up. In whatever together. ratio you want. Yeah, so unfortunately, we can't access that as expats. We have to have a two-fund portfolio. But for, for UK investors, for US investors, Canadian investors, it's super simple. And, and I've never looked back. I've never wasted any time reading fund management prospectuses or looking at annual reports. Um, I, I don't own any individual stocks or anything like that. Uh, life is so much simpler. I think in the age of the internet as well, um, we can research so many things. You know, I've personally learned a lot from uh, Ben Felix. So I've uh, been watching his videos and that's been a great source of knowledge and information for me. You should look him up if you... Are you aware of him or...? No, I'll, yeah, I'll check you him You should. Out. I've absolutely learned a lot from him. Uh, but then um, what did it for me was, you know, getting in touch with you and, you know, fi getting you to give me some of your time to help me out and ask all of the uh, silly questions that helped me fill the gaps. And that was a super help and um, that was super helpful and uh, pretty much now I'm completely committed to this style of investing Amazing. and I think it's a game changer uh, for me personally. So uh, Steve, that was brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for being on my show. I'm so happy. Thank you very much.